Mm-hmm. All right. Now, like I was saying, you know, as far as, you know, you right, conversation rules the nation. And we have to reach one and teach one. But to, the thing about it is, though, these guys don't have no time. And the reason why I say they don't have no time is because when we was growing up, yeah, a lot of people was dying around us. But not at the rate they die in these days. And, he, and you had the chance, I had the chance to see the era of our ways. My mama was praying for me, man. I can't deny that. You feel what I'm saying? Um, I was being prayed for. And not only that, somebody cared enough for me to tell me, hey, you should do this, you should do this, you should try that. And then I had the ear to listen. You know what I'm saying? That's the thing. I was ready to get out of that. I was ready to leave that type of lifestyle alone. And how, you know what I say? We need more examples. LeBron did this commercial, man. And I'm not really into the basketball like, you know, everybody around me is, you know, don't get me wrong, I love Cleveland, the championship and all that. But he, that last commercial he made when he was like, we don't need no more LeBrons. He said, we got, we need a thousand engineers. We need 1,500 scientists. We need, I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. I'm sitting there clapping at the, I'm sitting there clapping at the TV because he's letting them know we need you in school. We need math and science. It's, it's sad that we took a uh, wood shop, car mechanics, drafting, welding, uh, home construction. We took all that out of schools. And now look at our city. We talk about dilapidated houses. Man, come on, man. Come on. It costs $5,000 to tear a house down. Put it in escrow. Give it to a young man who can fix it and can put it back together, man. Let him work and strive to do that. Let him have a foundation. You ain't supposed to bring a wife home until you got uh, uh, some land and a fence around it. How you gonna keep your house and your property safe and your vegetables in your garden? You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, all I'm saying is we need to think about the educational system. Everybody's not going to college, man. Everybody's not. Some people need to work with their hands. Some people need to work with their mouths. Everybody's not smart enough to sit down in the classroom and to be able to articulate and to make it happen like that. It ain't that everybody's not smart enough, but people are smart in different things. Well, yeah. I mean, I never said they weren't smart enough, but you, you're right. Break it down, for real. It ain't that they're not smart enough. It's just that their mind or, or, or their, 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 their skill or, or what push them over the top is in a whole nother field. And we neglected to bring that forward. You know what I'm saying? Why we not? Why we don't have auto mechanics in school no more? Why we don't have uh, construction in, in, in the school no more? The average ki- uh, the average young man that can build a house or can fix the house or totally rehab a house can get to any one of these houses and put them back together with mon- with, with, with a small amount of money because material labor always costs more money than the material. Always. So if he got the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to get in there and make it happen. He'll get the materials. We can help him with the materials. Yeah. But we'd rather tear the house down and keep or the just, cycle going. Or just leave it sitting there for years and it'd be a danger for or in, in our soul or the community. Listen, when it comes down to, to really be affected by the opiates, it has to be in your home, okay? It really has to be in your home. It can't be on TV. It can't be down the street. It has to be right here where we at. And since it's right here where we at, we can see firsthand of how it affects us. See, a lot of people, they hear about it, they, they, they see it on TV, but it really don't affect them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Then they say, oh, well, it affects white people, but since it's affecting white people, now they care about it. I don't care who it affects for them to care about it. We should care about it anyway. I know, man, back where I'm from, there's nobody who's watching this right now, or mm-hmm. nobody that I know, that opioids has not affected their, them in some way or fashion or form, either personally or someone in it they care about. And, 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 and that's what it is. That's what it is. You know what I'm saying? That's what it is. See, because the areas that they put it in, the areas that they make it to, I can't even say the areas that they put it in. I'm not going to blame it on no one. You know what I'm saying? Because every time I went to go get my drug of choice, I went and I looked for it and I bought it and I did what I did to use it to get high off of it or whatever the case may be, sell it, whatever it was, whatever it was you know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, if it's not in the area, I'm going to go get it. We see American Gangster, Denzel say, I'm going to go get it where they go get it at. You know what I'm saying? It ain't got wait for it to come to me. I'm going to go get it. So when it comes down to uh, 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 the stress level, when it comes down to the health, when it comes down to the, the, the lack of understanding that these drugs are put on here to tear us apart and to kill us, if we're not being taught those things, if we're not instilling that in our children and instilling that in ourselves, if we're going to make excuses for one drug and say one drug is okay, but not these over here, Hell, they all drugs. They all bad. You feel what I'm saying? So therefore, we can't leave no window or doubt because it's affecting our children. 
That's who it's affecting. We, the, the crack babies are self-medicating now, man. You know what I'm saying? It ain't that weed and all of a sudden on the scene or something new when it come to weed. No, we been here. You know what I'm saying? We here, but now they putting all these different chemicals on it. It ain't what it used to be. And none of this stuff is what it used to be. And everything has to get stronger. It's getting smaller and it's getting stronger in order to have the same effect. Well, man, I appreciate you coming on Relate with Nate. It's you nice already seeing know. you again, man. It's been a while. It's been a while. Remember, I'm always going to be here for you, man. You better be. Yeah, you know, always. To to you, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dude. Thank you for having me on the show, man. Thank you for coming up to Cleveland, man, to see me. Man, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm blessed to be able to make this trip. I'm right. To come see you. I'm glad. Hey, guys, we're here in Akron, Ohio. We're here at the Summit County Public Health. We have uh, two very nice people who decided to give us some of their time and explain to us what they have going on here. Um, and then I'll, let, I'll tell them why we're here and where we're going with our tour and everything. So if you don't mind introducing yourself. Sure. I'm Jackie Pollard. I'm the Assistant Director of Community Health here at the Public Health Department. And I'm Jared Pyle. I am a peer supporter with Project Dawn, the Summit Safe Syringe Exchange, and the Quick Response Team. So um, you said you were with, you had, with the Needle Exchange Program. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, so Summit Safe Syringe Exchange Program is set up um, for clients to come in on an anonymous basis um, and uh, uh, obtain 10 new syringes every week with... Um, yeah, if they, when they come, they bring their used syringes. Yeah, they bring their used ones. And they can bring as many as they want. Um, and we give them 10 syringes plus um, other supplies that they can then take with them. Um, our hope is to one day be able to give them an equal amount of syringes. So if they bring us 50, we'll give them 50. But at this point, we have some limited budgeting. So we give them 10 clean syringes, regardless of however many they um, bring in to us. Um, we recently went to a place in West Virginia that had done the same thing. And, um, you know, people have mixed feelings about it. Some people are really for it. Some people are against it. What would you say to somebody who was against uh, the needle exchange? Yeah, what I what um, I believe is that it's a, a harm reduction program. The whole point of it is to decrease the spread of disease and illnesses. It's not treatment. It's not a solution. It's just a way to keep people healthier and safer, so that um, we can get syringes off the street and we can also. Um, reduce the risk of them getting bloodborne diseases like HIV and hepatitis, um, which are far costlier to treat and more deadly um, than giving them any kind of syringes. So um, it's just one more tool in our kind of fight against the opiate um, crisis that we're having. Okay, it's good you mentioned the opioid crisis because that's what we've been doing is traveling around pretty much the East Coast and we've been talking to people in different areas about the opioid um, crisis and how it's affected them and some of the positive things they're doing to uh, fight it. So uh, I heard you guys have a whole bunch of programs and different things going on here in this area. We do. Um, Summit County has been really hard, was hit really hard last year um, with the introduction of fentanyl and carfentanil. Um, and so the um, county leadership has been working together to try to get enough programs um, and strategies in place so that we can um, help get people into treatment and kind of keep people alive. So um, one of those um, programs is our Project Dawn, which is our naloxone um, program. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Narcan, right? Narcan. Yeah, that's our right. Narcan program. Absolutely. Our Narcan program um, is phenomenal. Um, we, walk, we go into different uh, facilities or different organizations or just to anybody that's uh, out on the street at a community event looking to um, you know, hopefully save maybe a loved one's life. Um, they can obtain the Narcan kit after going through about a 30-minute training, uh, filling out a little bit of paperwork, and then uh, you know, they're able to leave that day with a prescription um, that our doctor um, you know, writes for them, essentially. And... Um, the kit, actually, I was excited when uh, we, we moved up to the four milligram kits because with that carfentanil we discussed, um, you know, two milligrams with some of the old uh, kits, the old Narcan kits, mm -hmm. wasn't quite enough to bring someone out of that overdose. 
And um, so these kids are now a little bit stronger for these people out here too, struggling, really. I went through the training for, Nar for the Narcan. I have some sitting on my dresser at home. And um, when they told me, they said sometimes it takes eight, you know, to, mm -hmm. to save someone's life. So. Mm -hmm. It does. Our yes. goal, though, is to just get people breathing until the paramedics can get there. And so, um, and, and so the dosage that we get out, give out is just enough to get people breathing, but you still have to call 911. We also um, distribute um, Narcan with a grant that we have from the state for any of the police departments that want to carry it. So most, if not all, of our police departments in Summit County are carrying Narcan. Um, as they're coming across people all over the place that are overdosing, um, they're able to administer that while they're waiting for the paramedics to get there or the EMS squad to get there. So, and then we also focus on um, family members, community members, um, anybody that knows somebody that might need it, we want to uh, get a kit in their hands. Um, and other places where people who may overdose will be. So for example, um, he, um, Jared went to the courts the other day and is working with some of the court staff um, to get trained in Narcan and do overdose um, recognition and prevention. Have you guys had any uh, pushback as far as with the Narcan? Overall, I think the majority of people, I would say, are, are welcome to the idea of, you know, I would be able to save someone's life with this. I think the most common question I hear is, is there legal percussions for me helping someone in that moment? And usually if you can break down that barrier, there's some House Bill 170 and different things that are put in place to protect the citizen and, and uh, the situation. So. I think that's the question I hear the most. That's the pushback. I know in West Virginia, I think as long as you call 911, I've been recovered. Like, I can't administer that to you and then just say, all right, man, have a good day. Yeah. Like, I have to call 911 and make sure everything's all right, I believe. So, we have a limited um, Good Samaritan mm -hmm. bill that prohibits you from um, getting in trouble if you um, administer Narcan or if you call for help. That was the other pieces that we had a lot of people that weren't calling to get help because mm -hmm. they were afraid they were going to get re arrested. And so we were finding lots of people that had overdosed that had been abandoned. And so Ohio did pass a Good Samaritan law that gives us some protection. So, um, but um, our legislation pretty much makes it so you're liability free from administering any of it. The only pushback that we get is at times, um, you know, the debate about should we be spending resources on um, saving people's lives who aren't necessarily um, ready or wanting to go to, into treatment. And, um, you know, there have been some counties in Southern Ohio that have debated this. Um, our perspective is that, you know, nobody can Nobody gets into recovery if you're not alive to do it. And so first and foremost, we have to protect life and keep people alive. Um, and we're going to do that as many times as it takes because um, it's like other diseases. We don't limit how many times you can get treated for diabetes, heart disease. We shouldn't be um, limiting how often you can get treated for an addiction since it's also a chronic brain disease. So you were talking about your, the peer support thing. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So peer support is really just set up um, for someone to come along who's been on um, the other side, been actively using, to come alongside of the person that is either trying to get into recovery or maybe at that other spectrum, not sure what they want. Um, you're really just meant to jump in the hole, I say, with somebody who's suffering from the disease of addiction. And um, we really look at what I call a wellness plan, and that wellness plan just goes hand in hand with treatments idea. So if they're working on treatment plans, we're working on a wellness plan. And that wellness plan is really just, you know, your goal is to go to school. How do we even do that? You know, where do we start from here? You don't have a high school diploma? Let's figure out how we get it. Um, because then you can fulfill your treatment goals. And, um, you know, peer support comes along in a lot of other fashions as well. You know, while I'm here at Public Health, um, that role is really, um, you know, extended out to the families with this project on and then back to the addict who's, who's not willing to maybe come to treatment in the moment. 
but just show a little love and compassion at that syringe exchange to them. You know. And then with the quick response team, you know, that role of peer support is really just to show up saying, I know what you're going through, and um, we can get better from this. We can recover. So you're saying pretty much you're meeting people where they're at and you're helping them get to where they need to be or where they're trying to go. Exactly. I mean, there's really no, um, I think you should be here, let's get there. Everybody's plan is different. And sometimes these overdose, someone needs to overdose 10 or 12 or, or there's an individual with 15 or 16 overdoses and that's where a recovery coach or a peer supporter, excuse me, would meet them. Um, and we would build from there, wherever that mm -hmm. takes us. And we really find too is that people um, with lived experience brings a different level of richness and compassion to our program. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people um, can be intimidated by healthcare professionals, counselors, um, but when they're able to connect with someone and see somebody that has walked the path and made it on to the other side and is living in recovery, um, it, can, it can be just a really profound experience. And so we really appreciate being able to have, you know, peer support recovery coaches that um, can connect with people in a different way than say I could as a counselor. All right, guys, is there anything else you'd like to say to the people out there and relate with Nate World? Um, I do want to mention our quick response team, okay. if we can, just because um, it's uh, pretty innovative. We and, and Jared is working on that. We have actually partnered with our local police and our local EMS. And so um, once a week, they review all the people that, um, a kind of a list of all the people that have had a recent overdose, and they actually go out to their homes, knocking on doors, um, talking to them about, um, you know, is there a way that we can help you? Have you thought about maybe going to treatment? You had this overdose that was near fatal. You know, how can we be helpful to you? Um, so that people get a, um, a different experience than maybe what they've had in the past. In the past, people that use often see the police as being um, kind of the bad guy. They're there to arrest them. Um, this is really trying to send the message that you have a community that's looking out for you and that's interested in you and, um, and really want to help you. So they go out every week. Um, if the person isn't home, they leave handwritten notes. They may call later on to follow up, but it's instead of waiting for people to come to us to get help, we're really trying to go out there and reach out to them to get them um, to meet them where they are in their homes and um, you know get them connected with whatever they need. Could be a Narcan kit. We talk to families about somebody here in your house overdose. Can we get you a Narcan kit? Um, you know, can we leave you a resource guide in case you change your mind or you're interested? Um, you know, here's some information, but we're, as a community, here to help you and want to help you. So, I think that's great because a lot of times if you wait on people to come to you, they don't make it. That's exactly, exactly. Yeah. And on, um, with the number of overdose deaths, fatal overdoses, we just think that it's something that um, we need to aggressively reach out to. So the model started in Coleraine Township, which is further south of us. Um, and so um, we work with, again, we're working in um, Akron City, where we're having um, about 20 overdoses a, a week. Um, not all fatal, but we're having 20 overdoses. And so, um, so Jared is part of that team. They meet. Um, and then they go out and knock on doors and say, how are you? How can we help you? So, um, yeah, so we're real excited. We're new in this. It's only been a couple months, but um, we're getting some positive results of people that have had several overdoses but now are showing up for treatment um, or calling for help. And, you know, that's at the end of the day, that's what we really want to do is get people connected with the help they need. Yeah, and you're building trust and building relationships. So, Absolutely. You know. And the community gets to see um, our police and our paramedics and our EMS in a different light. This is a different role for them. And so um, instead of 
um, always experiencing them on the other side, the criminal justice side. They're really able to see that these are people that are out there to protect and serve everybody in the community. And so they really want to help people. So it's a it's an exciting program, actually. Sounds exciting. We need to work on something like that at home, yeah. actually. Community policing, I think, is working here. It is. It really is. It is. You know, one of the things when the opiate epidemic hit is, you know, we all realize that you can't arrest your way out of this. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past, they, um, you know, with the war on drugs, it was if you use, you're going to jail, you're going to prison. If you sell, you're going to prison. The volume of people, it's we're just not going to arrest our way out of it. So it's got to be um, a multitude of strategies. And so um, we're trying to come up with everything we can to um, hit it in every possible way so we can hopefully save some lives and get ahead of this and get things turned around. Sounds good, man. I all appreciate right. y'all coming over late all with right. Nate, yeah. sharing yeah. all this Appreciate great you. stuff. All right. Well, thank you, you for having room. us. Yeah, I mean, we you. really appreciate you getting the word out about. Yeah. Y'all can thank Corey. We'll see, have Corey on in a little while. Yeah. I think me and him is going to do a wrestling match instead of an interview. Though. All right. That yeah. would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm up for it. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Williamson Health and Wellness Center operates a federally qualified health center located on 2nd Avenue in downtown Williamson, West Virginia, providing adult and adolescent care, behavioral health, dental, optometry, pediatric, and preventive health care services. Projects such as Healthy in the Hills, Mingo County Diabetes Coalition, and the Williamson Farmers Market foster long-term community wellness and prosperity. Stop by our office or visit online. Learn how together we can build a culture of health and wellness for everyone.